What's going on guys, my name is Matt and I am back with a new PC build. This time the price point is $1250 and this is an all new part build. This video is going to be a full build guide, meaning I'm not only going to show you each of the parts and why I picked them, but I'm also going to be showing you how to put everything together step by step. And then finally I'm going to be showing you both gaming and streaming benchmarks. This is a beast of a system perfect for 1080p and 1440p gaming along with streaming and video editing. Taking into account the current market. It, I think this is offering a great value and this is super easy to build making it great for first time builders. While there are obviously tons of different ways you could have spent this budget, I went for parts that I know are quality, that will work well together and will last you a long time. I'm happy to say this build is in partnership with Micro Center. Now if you haven't heard of Micro Center, they're basically the best place to buy PC parts in store and currently they have a promotion where grabbing the coupon in the description and just showing up in store will get you a free 200 40 gigabyte SSD absolutely free. They also have a PC builder that allows you to part out a system using parts that are in store and ready to be purchased. To find a micro center near you, get a free SSD and check out their PC builder. Check the links in the description. And again, thanks to micro center for helping out with this build. Getting back to the video, like I said before, this is a beast of a system being able to game, stream, and edit. I'm going to show you how to put this guy together and set it up, but I first want to show you each of the parts and talk about why I picked them. So the first thing I usually select with the system is the CPU. This determines a number of other factors for the build and other than the GPU this has the biggest impact on gaming performance. At the time of pricing this build out, the Ryzen 5 5600G can easily be found for under $240 which is a very good value in my opinion. The 5600G is a 6 core 12 thread CPU running on the latest Zen 3 architecture. It's a good jack of all trade CPU offering a ton of performance for not only gaming but also heavily multi-threaded applications like streaming and video editing. This has a base and boost clock of 3.9 and 4.4 GHz out of the box, which is very respectable, but just like all Ryzen CPUs, this can be overclocked for even more performance. One other great thing about this CPU is the fact it comes with a cooler free in the box. This is the Wraith Stealth Cooler. This isn't anything flashy and it's basically just a hunk of aluminum with a fan attached, but as you'll see in the benchmarks, it's able to keep the 5600G cool and quiet. Sure, going for an aftermarket cooler would be a decent idea, but using the free option here allows us to save money and use those savings towards other parts of the build. Moving on to the motherboard, I decided to go with the Asus B550 Plus. This is an ATX board using the B550 chipset and coming in at around $115. This is offering a ton of features for the price, including four DIMM slots, multiple M.2 slots, decent back panel I.O., and an adequate VRM setup. Some other things I like about this board is the fact it has plenty of PCIe slots for future expansion, and I think it looks great also. The black and silver neutral color scheme is able to fit in most any build and still look good. While there are a number of boards cheaper and more expensive than this, I think the B550 Plus is offering some of the best features and value at this price point. The next thing to talk about is RAM. Ryzen loves fast memory, so while I didn't want to spend too much, I still wanted to get a fast dual channel kit. What I ended up going for is this 2x8GB kit of Team Group T-Force Dark DDR4 RAM. This is a 3600MHz kit, which is kind of the sweet spot in terms of price to performance when paired with a Ryzen chip. At the current going rate of $65, this is offering a great value in my opinion. 16GB is plenty for gaming, streaming, and even light video editing. One other nice thing is that because this is only taking up two of the four DIMM slots, it means upgrading to 32 gigabytes of RAM in the future is as simple as popping in two more 8 gigabyte sticks. For storage, I knew I wanted an NVMe M.2 SSD because of the fast speeds and ease of installation. At this price point, I wanted to go for a 1TB drive as this will give you plenty of storage for your OS, applications, and a number of games. What I went with is this 1TB WD SM550, which at the time of purchase came in at a little over $80, which was an amazing value, but the price has jumped up to around $100 for this drive, which is still decent. The SM550 is considered a solid budget budget NVMe SSD that works great as a boot drive for a gaming system like this one. Also, like I said before, this is in the M.2 form factor, meaning installation is super simple and takes less than a minute to install. 
The next thing to talk about is the part you all have been waiting for, the graphics card. Obviously GPUs are crazy expensive right now. Myself and others have recommended going used for budget builds, but for this system I wanted to go new as I know many of you aren't comfortable buying from the used market. After some deliberation, I decided to go for the AMD RX 6600 XT. This is able to be found on sites like Newegg for around $550 to $600. Is this a great value for that price? Yes and no. For a new card this is a decent value taking into account the current market but is still well above its MSRP. The one I'm using in this build is the very basic Power Color Fighter version. It's utilizing a very simple dual fan design with no backplate, but performance is as good as pretty much any other 6600 XT on the market. The reason I went for this version is that because it's the one I could get my hands on. This is why I'm going to recommend just buying the cheapest 6600 XT you can find. As long as it's under 335mm long, it will fit in this case. This 6600 XT, like all versions, offers great 1080p and even 1440p gaming performance. It is 8GB of video memory and should give you good performance for years to come. Next up, let's talk about the power supply. This system only has an estimated power usage of a little over 300 watts, but I still wanted something super reliable and with plenty of headroom for future upgrades. Because of this, I decided to go for the EVGA 600GD, which can be had for around $60 to $70. Like the name implies, this is 600 watt, 80 plus gold unit. 600 watts is more than enough for this build and the 80 plus gold rating means this is a very efficient unit. EVGA is a brand I trust a lot and there's really only one downside to this PSU. The downside I'm referring to is the fact it's a non-modular unit, but all the extra cables are easily hidden thanks to our case. Speaking of that, the last part to talk about is the case. What I went with is the Antec NX410. For around $70, this case offers a really good value. It features a hinging magnetic side panel, power supply basement, one really nice thing is the fact that not only does it include three fans, but all of those fans are RGB and able to be controlled easily through a button on the case. The final thing I'll note about it is the fact it's really easy to build in, making it easy to recommend. All in all, for $1250, you're getting a set of quality parts that'll last you a long time and allow you to do a ton of different stuff on your PC, from gaming to streaming to even editing. So now that you've seen each of the parts and why I picked them, I'm now going to show you how to put it together. There are a number of ways and orders to assemble this system, but I'll go over my preferred method. You'll want to have a normal sized and small Phillips head screwdriver, and you may also need a pair of pliers to install the standoffs. With your workspace clear, your parts in hand, and your schedule free, it's now time to start assembling your PC. So the first thing you're going to want to get out is your motherboard box. Go ahead and open it up, take out the board itself, the I.O. shield that looks like this, and the bag containing the M.2 standoffs and screws. Pull the motherboard out of the bag and place it on top of the box. Now get out your CPU box. Take your attention to the center of the motherboard. Go ahead and press down, out, and pull up on the CPU or tension arm until it's perpendicular to the board. Now grab your CPU, handling it only by the edges, and line the marked corner on the CPU with the marked corner on the motherboard or the 5600G text with the socket AM4 text on the motherboard. Once aligned, lower the CPU into place applying no pressure, it should just drop in. Once in, you can lower the lever arm back down making sure it clips into place. Now before we install our cooler, we need to remove these two pieces of plastic by removing these four screws. Just go ahead and take out each screw one by one then lift the plastic piece away. Now you can grab your cooler. If you flip it over, you'll be able to see there is thermal paste already applied. Make sure not to touch this because contaminants could hinder cooling performance. Go ahead and lower this into place with the AMD logo facing the back panel I.O. and lining up these screws on the cooler with the standoffs in the back plate. Next, tighten these screws down in a cross pattern a few turns at a time until it's tightened all the way down. If you want the AMD logo facing up like mine, then all you have to do is remove these four little screws, rotate the fan 90 degrees, then reinstall the screws you just removed. This is 100% optional, but I think for how easy it is, the aesthetic improvement is well worth it. With that done, you can now grab the CPU fan wire and bring it to the CPU fan connector located to the top right of the cooler. The connector and the header have a notch in them. Line these two notches up and press the connector into place. Now you can tuck the excess cable length away to keep the build looking clean. With that done, you've successfully installed your CPU and CPU cooler, meaning we can now move on to our RAM. Take out your RAM kit containing your two sticks of RAM and move your attention to the four RAM slots on the motherboard. Open up the latches on the second and fourth slot from the CPU socket. Take your 
your first stick and line up the notch in the stick with the notch in the slot and lower it into place. Once you're sure it's lowered incorrectly, press down on each side until you hear a click and see the clip close. Now just repeat the same process with the other stick in the fourth slot. With that done, your RAM is successfully installed and we can now move on to installing our SSD. Get out your SSD and bring your attention to the M.2 slot towards the bottom of the board. Take one of the M.2 standoffs and screw it into the hole right here. Now take your SSD and line the notch in it with the notch in the slot and insert it at an angle like this. Now you can hinge it down and secure it with the M.2 screw we pulled out of the motherboard box earlier. With that done, you can put your motherboard to the side and grab out your case box. Pulling the box away from the case instead of pulling the case is much easier and highly recommended. With your case out of the box, you can hinge open and lift up on the glass side panel to remove it, then just set it to the side. Next, remove the bottom and top thumb screws on the back panel. Next you can just pull on and lift away this panel. With that set to the side you can pinch and pull out on the drive sled. This holds a box that contains all the screws necessary to assemble this PC. Once the box is removed just reinstall the sled back into place. Out of the screw bag grab three standoffs that look like this. We'll be installing them in here here, and here. I like to hand start them then come back with a nut driver or pliers to tighten them down the rest of the way. Now you can grab the IO shield we pulled out of the motherboard box earlier, orient it like this and bring it to the IO cutout. Once lined up, press in each corner one at a time until they snap in and the IO shield is secure. One final thing to do before installing our motherboard is to remove covers 2 and 3 on the PCIe IO until they snap off and can be lifted away. With that done, you can now grab your motherboard, handling it by the cooler, and lower it in at an angle like this, lining up the I.O. with the I.O. shield and making sure you can see the standoffs beneath the motherboard holes. Now you can grab out 9 motherboard screws that look like this, take them and install one into each of the corresponding holes on the motherboard. Order doesn't matter, just make sure they're tightened all the way down. With that done, you can now lift the case back onto its feet, undo the twist ties on these wires, and grab out your power supply. With the fan facing down, insert it into the back of the case like this. Now grab out the four screws that came in the power supply box and install one into each of the corresponding holes at the back of the case to secure the power supply. We're now ready to start routing cables. Begin by grabbing your 8-pin CPU cable that looks like this and insert it through this hole up here. Next grab the big 24-pin cable and insert it through this hole here. Now grab one of the 8 8-pin PCIe power cables and insert it through the hole down here. Next grab the blue USB 3 cable and insert it through the same hole as the 24 pin went through. Now take the cable labeled HD audio and insert it through this hole over here. Next take the USB 2 cable and push it through here and finally route the little front panel connectors through here. Now before we flip the case onto its side take one of the Molex cables from the power supply and plug it into the Molex connector from the case like this. With that done you can now put the case onto its side where we'll begin to plug things in. Start by bringing your attention to the top left of the motherboard and by grabbing our CPU power cable and plug it into the CPU power header by lining the clip on the connector with the bump out on the header then pressing it into place. With that done, we can move to the right side of the case where we'll plug in the 24 pin and USB 3. Start by taking the 24 pin making sure it's pressed together, line up the clip on the connector with the bump out on the header and press it into place. For USB 3 just take the connector and line the bump out on it with the cutout on the header and press it into place. We can now move our attention to the bottom of the board starting at the left side. Take the HD audio cable and bring it to the HD audio header on the motherboard. With the HD audio text facing up, line it up and press it into place. Next take the USB 2 cable and plug it into one of the two open headers with the USB text facing down. Now we can plug in the pesky front panel connectors. Start with the HDD LED one and plug it into the bottom left two pins with the positive side to the left. Now take the power LED connector and plug it in directly above the hard drive LED again with the positive to the left. Finally take the power switch connector and press it in directly to the right of the power LED. With all those cables plugged in, we are now ready to start the process of installing the GPU. At the back of the case, loosen the screw, lift up the cover, then tighten it back down. Now you can open the PCIe lock on the top slot like this and grab your graphics card. Line the notch in the PCIe slot with the notch in the card and press it into place making sure the lock snaps shut. Now at the back of the case, you can lower the cover back down and secure the GPU with one or more of these screws. Now you can take your PCIe power cable and line up the clip and bump out and press it into place. Place. With that done, everything is installed, but we have one more thing to do before closing the system up, which is cable management. Basically, just pull any excess cable link to the back of the case and tuck it away slash try to make it as flat as possible so the back panel can easily be reinstalled. 
Just make sure the main chamber looks nice and the cables are flat and you're going to be fine. You can now press the back panel on like this and re-secure the two thumb screws. With the case on its side, reinstall the glass panel and hinge it into place. Now your build is complete, but there are a few more things that need to be done software wise before you can start gaming and streaming. The first order of business is installing the OS. You can run Windows 10 free unactivated with the only downside being a little watermark or you can purchase a key from one of the key seller sites. I'm not going to show you how to install Windows in this video, but I'll link a tutorial on how to do this in the description, so make sure to check that out if you don't know how to install Windows. Next you need to install drivers. For the chipset drivers, head to the link in the description, scroll down, select chipset, socket AM4, then B550, hit submit, select Windows 10 64-bit, and download the latest version. Once downloaded, open it up, hit install, and once installed, restart your PC. For the graphics drivers, head to the link in the description, select graphics, 6000 series, 6600 XT, and then hit submit. Download and install the latest drivers under Windows 10. Restart your PC, if things are looking good, restart your PC again, but as it's booting back up, mash the delete key to enter into the BIOS. Under DCOP, change it to Profile 1, then hit F10 to save and exit. With that done, you're ready to start downloading and enjoying some games. Speaking of games, it's now time to talk about gaming performance, streaming performance, and temps. I didn't test a ton of games, but these should be enough to give you a good idea of the system's overall performance, so let's start things off from the hard to run games and work our way down. The most difficult to run game I tested was Cyberpunk 2077. This is notoriously hard to run even on high end systems. Starting with 1080p high settings, I just drove around fast and doing this resulted in an average of 73 with 1% lows of 52. This was pretty good performance, but I also wanted to test at 1440p. I did the same driving test at 1440p medium settings and was happy to see the system produced a 62 FPS average with 1% lows of 45. This is really good performance in my opinion and shows that the system should be able to handle any AAA game at 1440p with 60 plus FPS. The next game tested was Borderlands 3, which is also relatively hard to run. I used the built-in benchmark at 1440p high settings and saw a 72 FPS average with 1% lows of 64. Again, getting a 60 plus FPS average at 1440p is great to see. Dropping down to 1080p high settings, the FPS produced was an average of 108 with 1% lows of 87. Overall performance on Borderlands 3 was really good in my opinion. Next up is Shadow of the Tomb Raider which is getting older at this point but is still a AAA title that is somewhat difficult to run. I used the built in benchmark starting at 1440p high settings. The system produced a 93 FPS average with 1% lows of 64. Going down to 1080p high settings, the system was able to put out a 130 FPS average with 1% lows of 82. This shows that older AAA titles should be able to run on this system at well over 100 FPS depending on your settings and resolution. Moving on to an easier to run game, Rainbow Six Siege, I test this first at 1440p very high settings using the built in benchmark. Doing this resulted in a 249 FPS average with 1% lows of 145. When I dropped the resolution down to 1080p again with very high settings, the system produced a 292 FPS average with 1% lows of 166. Overall, this is very good performance and should be more than enough for competitive play. The final game tested is Valorant. I started by testing at 1440p high and hopping into a game I saw an average of 218 with 1% lows of 102. This was pretty good but surprisingly dropping to 1080p high and even 1080p low only resulted in an average of 20 to 40 extra FPS. Don't get me wrong, 245 FPS average is great, but I expected it to be higher. One thing I noticed was neither the CPU or GPU were being fully utilized, and the GPU stayed at or below 1000 MHz most of the time. With all this being said, performance was overall good in Valorant, but I'm wondering if a driver update will produce better performance. Moving on to streaming, I tested streaming both Valorant and Borderlands 3 to Twitch at 1080p 60fps. Borderlands 3 was played at 1080p high settings with a frame rate locked at 60fps, and Valorant was played at 1080p high with FPS locked at 144 
Hertz. In my testing, the gameplay and stream both looked and performed great, so the system should be able to stream pretty much any game you want it to. Finally, let's talk about temps. While gaming, the CPU stayed in the range of the low 50s all the way up to the high 60s depending on the game, and the GPU ranged from the low 60s to the mid 70s depending on the game. So as you guys can see, the system performs really well in both 1080p and 1440p gaming, along with streaming. All in all, for $1,250, taking into account the current market, I think this system is offering a good value and should last you for years to come. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. These guides are a lot of work, but if you keep watching them, then I'll keep making them. Thanks again to Micro Center for helping out with this video, and make sure to check them out. Links are in the description. Oh, and as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.